This is the Anarchist War Journal entry number 16, and I'm going to go over day two at the Mises University. I'm going to go over some highlights, some good finer points from these lectures that are probably familiar to you, but they're good refresher points to remember in your discourse of the freedom of the free market versus the evils of socialism, of course. So the first lecture that I attended was by Professor Terrell on common objections to capitalism. And one finer point that you should always have in your arsenals to always bring up when people talk about capitalism is this one right here. Today, of Americans officially designated as poor, 99% have electricity, running water, flush toilets, and a refrigerator. 95% have a television, 88% a telephone, 71% a car, and 70% air conditioning. He threw in a tidbit information there of Cornelius Vanderbilt, who lived in the 1800s, one of the richest people in the world. He had none of these things. So you can say then, in terms of our course conditions as tax slaves here in the 21st century, we do have it better off in terms of comparing the tax slaves of the past. Uh, not to say that we want to compare that uh, which is better, right? There's no, uh, there's, you either have freedom or slavery, one or the other, right? There's no, well, my cage is nicer than yours. But this is kind of goes to show in terms of capitalism alleviating a lot of the pains and miseries that tax slaves in the past had to incur. And that we today uh, have an enormous, I would say, should give a lot of gratitude and gratefulness towards what capitalism has produced for us, right? And this is a great way to show how capitalism has helped, how capitalism alleviates impoverishment, the poor, uh, especially horrible working conditions that we're going to go over next. And that was great to, to see out there again, right? In terms of like people talk about minimum wage and, and the poor here in the United States, the poor here are considered rich versus the poor in Bolivia, for example, or like the poor in Brazil right now with the Olympics going up out there and people having to actually swim and shit. The water's not good for anyone. I mean, talk about the water in Michigan, Flint, Michigan. The, anything you drink over there is surely going to hurt you. Um, and that's so it seems. And so, yeah, the poor here, I would say in relation to the poor in other parts of the world, I, it's considered very, very wealthy. And another point to kind of bring up is that there's 7 billion people on this planet. 6 billion and billion of them have access to a cellular phone. That is amazing. Amazing. The second lecture that we went over was uh, Calculation and Socialism with Professor Salerno. This was a fun one. <laughs> so one of the earlier founders of socialism, you know, things to, to kind of look back in like archaeology, how did this stuff come about? Started with... A, with a lot of crazy people, one in particular by the name of Charles Fourier. And he thought that through the achievement of socialism, you'll finally have this world hippie harmony. And it'll be brought to you by several key points, stages. And that would be that there will be six new moons replacing the current one. The seas will turn into a fruity drink, a Kool-Aid. Animals will no longer be dangerous to us, and they will no longer be called lions. They'll be called anti-lions, and they would gladly serve themselves up to you and on a platter, pretty much, right, for you to kind of to slay and to cook up without any kind of resistance. They'll never put up against you. And also, there'll be chicken that will just fly in the air right into your mouth. <laughs> I can't make this up. Another crazy part is that this paradise, this socialist paradise, would have us spend five, six of our time devoted to wild, wild orgies. So talk about when people say, well, yeah, anarchy is a uh, very utopian. This, <laughs> this shit is very utopian, crazy out there utopian. And one of the interesting uh, critiques that uh, pr the professor made in there and analyzing this is that this is perhaps why Marx didn't write so much on socialism. Because there was a lot of crazy shit that was out there in the spotlight. And he felt that perhaps it's best then to shift the focus, the spotlight, on critiquing capitalism instead of writing about it. Because there was a lot of stupid garbage coming out from there during that time. So 
that's uh, another maybe perhaps uh, motivation, you know, what his reason why he would go out there and try to trash capitalism, yeah, because his own stuff sucked and stinked. So the next lecture that we went over, great uh, economist, Professor Murphy, was uh, on energy economics. And this is a good one in that he was bringing up a good point. And of course, sometimes people will say that uh, if you have a market competition of utilities, eventually only one is going to dominate the geographic region. And then that is why you must have government uh, and control of the market. You can't have the free market to provide that because this could occur. And so you need government to then thus stop competition from ever occurring and to select one utility company to dominate this geographic region. So the very thing that they're afraid of, they allow government to choose and create themselves. And this would explain why dominion power here in the tax form of Virginia has been granted a state, uh, a state granted monopoly in this geographic region. And which is why no one is allowed to compete. The next one we went over was economics of fractional reserve banking with Professor Herbener. And this seemed like a straightforward accounting class. I took one this last semester, got an A, did pretty good. I actually enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. It was good to kind of see how these uh, financial statements are actually kind of put together. Uh, and of course, this went over the development of money in the market and how it would, would come and arise in the free market. And, and these sort of things will regulate themselves by, of course, profit and loss, right? In terms, of course, the Wall Street bailouts and which government didn't allow these businesses to fail when they're incurring these losses. And as so much that nobody ever shed a tear and Blockbuster closed their last doors because they were not generating enough profit to keep up and adapt and to evolve versus where Redbox and Netflix was able to carry the new future wave of rentals and entertainment. And so losses and profits are very important in that. It's something that uh, entrepreneurs themselves have to calculate in the center of generating new capitalistic or economizing <laughs> the environment and the world around them and seeing where is the market going to go, where are consumer preferences heading towards. And that is a very risky thing to do and not everyone can do it, of course. And the next lecture that was presented was by Professor Thornton on minimum wage. And it's always good to hear a lot of new arguments presented against it. Remember, minimum wage, the advocation of it is to oppress minorities, is to oppress the youth. And of course, there's a lot of Marxist children out there that will go out and say, well, capitalism is so evil. Look, during the Industrial Revolution, they put children into, into these factories to, to work. The alternative was starvation, death. So, you know, I choose uh, life <laughs> over dying, especially from starvation, especially from the ills of that kind of Marxism that took place in Maoist China, for example, in which parents were so starve-ridden that they ate their own children, right? Mothers and fathers would eat their sons and daughters. And so in terms of that, uh, there's not no talk about how capitalism stopped the end of that starvation and eventually started alleviating the problems of you will find of uh, children working in these factories. Well, of course, this comes with a lot of labor misconceptions in that the work week was already shrinking. Uh, children were no longer working in these uh, bad conditions in the factories and the coal mines. Um, so work hours were already being cut. Workplace environment safety, for example, was already improving. And this is these are things capitalism, the market was already pushing forth. That they were already pushing the boundaries and how we can better take care employees, uh, workers, laborers. This came before the unions and government to come in later afterwards to rob them of that credit and then to codify what was already happening in the market. So these people deserve no credit whatsoever and saying we've been here for the laborers, we've been here for the workers. No, you have not. This stuff was in place because of capitalism. Because of capitalism, it improved those environments and those situations and the livelihoods for many, many people. The next lecture that came up was Monopoly, Competition, and Antitrust with Professor De Lorenzo. And he was talking about the show of these uh, corporate takeover specialists versus CEOs and kind of duking it out. And the CEO would say, well, if you're going to take over, this is what I would do then to kind of improve the profit of my corporation. Um, and after outlining all the different ways that he would do it, the question then arises is why aren't you doing that now? 
why have you been waiting to do that now? All right? A lot of uh, people are kind of, you know, get too comfortable, get a little too lazy, get a little bit too complacent. And so the market kind of creates these other specialists to kind of knock out lazy, uh, inefficient uh, management. And so that's an interesting thing of, uh, I guess, a relationship up here in that particular level and the corporate structure that does take place and kind of weeds out uh, inefficiencies. And that was kind of fun to hear. There is uh, the last lecture was on sweatshops by Professor Powell. And this was a very fun one to listen to in which was discussing a lot of the arguments a lot of activists here go out there and trying to be very, you know, goody two shoes and saying that, well, these workplace environments of these labor shops are horrific, they're horrible. Um, and trying to go out and chastise and guilt trip a lot of people who have a lot of these uh, sweatshops in like South America, for example. And like, for example, they'll say, you know, you're making your t-shirts for, you're selling them for like $15, but the people who make them only make $2 a day and trying to guilt rid these people into seemingly like they're, they're horrible, bad, evil capitalists again. But of course, what he did is with that ridiculous statement, uh, he actually went down to South America. He actually went down there to find out what was actually happening because they'll say, well, with their previous questions that went that these activists will go out there and say, well, um, what you're currently making now, uh, do you think you'd be happier if you had better workplace conditions? And they say, yeah. I was like, would you like higher pay? Yeah. Would you like uh, less hours? Yeah. Would you like a vending machine? <laughs> you know, whatever. And of course they'll say, yeah, right? Would you like to have more uh, pay? Would you like to have a larger office? Would you like to have a company car? Uh, and of course, everyone would say yes. But what he did then is took the same questions and then asked them, would you have, would, would you take lower pay and return for having better environmental environment conditions and they said uh no uh would you take lower pay for uh shorter hours and they say no would you take lower pay etc 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 and took the same questions and of course finding out that these people actually are there for a reason and that they value what they're making there and that for the most part on on average what they make in these sweatshops is higher than the other salaries you'll find in those countries and dramatically, astronomically higher than what they'll find in any other type of occupation in those regions. So that's not a bad thing at all, I think, right? And of course, everyone would want these particular types of environments to improve. No one's saying that uh, these are awesome places to work at. But for these people, the alternative is to go to another job of employment that pays considerably less or starvation again, right? And he presented his research, which I think was awesome. And also relaying the fact in that during the 50s and 60s, Hong Kong was nothing but like sweatshop paradise. And look what it is today, right? These things get outsourced, these things kind of move out. When you have a lot more economic freedom, things grow to the sky and the, that kind of impoverishment goes away. And so that's generally what ends up happening in a lot of countries when the economic freedom reaches a certain level for example, child labor just drops off the map, just like it did here in the United States. Uh, these sweatshops conditions just drop off the map. And so that was, I think, uh, one of the most enlightening classes. That's something I've never heard of. That was uh, refreshing and definitely new to me. And that was uh, pretty cool to be a part of and to hear that lecture in person. So that was day two at the Mises Institute. It was a lot of fun. Good lectures, great professors. Awesome scholars, fellow scholars there as well with me, in which I'm going to leave it off with you guys just hearing more of their responses. So until then, stay liberated, and I'll see you guys at the virtue party. So where are you from, and what brings you to the Mises Institute? I am, so I'm from Indiana. I go to school in Minnesota at St. Olaf College. Um, I started... I guess I became interested in the Mises Institute from the International Students for Liberty Conference. So um, I met one of the people there with the Mises Institute and then he was like, oh, you should really go. And I was like, I don't know. And then, uh, yeah, that's kind of how that went. So <laughs> uh, I'm originally from California, born in Los Angeles, living in San Francisco. I come to the Mises Institute with the hopes to uh, understand Austrian economics and understand libertarian theory uh, a little bit better than I do as of right now.
I'm from Oklahoma State University, and I came to the Mises Institute to, you know, establish some semblance of, well, some context for the economics I'm studying since I am an economics major at Oklahoma State University. I'm also double majoring in mathematics, and I feel like Mises University being the hub of the Austrian school would, you know, also, once again, establish the context that math can be applied to economics. Uh, Liberty, Texas. I was born to, in, and raised by Liberty, so it was only a matter of time. Uh, and I come to Mises U because of G.P. Manesh writing my recommendation. What do you think of government, and should it be abolished? Well, I think um, what government is is best described by Rothbard when he says it's a Basically, it's parasitic by its nature, that it uh, acts as a exploiter of voluntary trade, it acts as an exploitation of hu human voluntary action, and it uses coercion to instigate a monopoly of coercive violent power upon people. I, I don't think it's peaceful, I think its very nature is violent, and I think it is something that we as humans should intellectually evolve beyond, because it is unnecessary. Yeah, I would say it should be abolished, so that would be my my short answer to that one. Um, government is essentially a body of coercion. Um, that's, that's fundamentally what it is, and coercion, in, I guess, in its essence, being evil, yeah, I, I would say it should be abolished. Government is 100% inept and inefficient. Anything that it does can be done better on the free market, uh, demonstrably so, and Especially given technology currently, there is absolutely no reason whatsoever for government. What does free market anarchy mean to you? Free market anarchy basically means to me that um, people are able to maximize their economic freedom and as well as their, uh, their own natural rights. And, uh, assume, and because if we, if we can maximize these, I feel like this is the only way that each individual person can, you know, maximize his or her own lifestyle and, by extension, society. That means that anarchic systems, which anarchy only means rule of the self, so naturally if some people want to organize together in a commune, they can do that. If people want to organize together and just have farming community mutualist type deal or if they want to trade all their things on the market, or if they want to do free market capitalism, right? So they can get together and use money in exchange. And in a truly free market, all those systems of self-rule will be able to compete with each other and we'll find out what is the best for mankind. Free market anarchy for me would be the probably the ability of individuals to uh, make their own choices. Um, and I think um, in my personal life, that would be the most important for me, so. Well, the idea of anarchy is an idea of chaos or uncontrollable um, anything. So you're, the idea is just it's not under the control of anything. So while the, the free market libertarians of the past were yelled at, or not yelled at, but were uh, told against by the communists that it was, it was too chaotic, it was too anarchic, the free market it was there was not we didn't know where it was going i think all, all in all that's a good thing that people need to be no longer afraid of the idea of anarchy but understand that what anarchy is is it's spontaneous combustion and through spontaneous combustion we have what joseph schumpeter referred to as creative destruction and an ultimate more productive system in the long run that all it does is it allows the entrepreneur to produ produce more than what they were doing previously so anarchy is a system of chaos. Uh, yes, it is, but it's good chaos. It's not bad chaos. Are you an enemy of the state? The definitive article. Yes. I would say so. I am an enemy of the state in the sense that I do not follow the state lines. I don't, I think freely, I act freely, I act as an individual and I do not consider myself in any part of the state apparatus. By that sense, I am an enemy of the state. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much.
all over the mental terrain. It takes a hell of a man nowadays to maintain garments blood stain. Face bruised and battered, eyes reflect agony. Of dreams that were shattered, it never mattered. To the so-called general republic, about my nation's situation and how we rise above it and live under. Will we self-destruct and kill a home? And the greater responsibility, yes, it's still our own. We should know by now that the system is designed for our demise. If we have rivals, we'll be left behind. Dollar signs rule. But what about the fool? Victim to the material world.